I guess we'll start. Today I'm going to do Sutta number 59, The Many Kinds of Feelings. One of the reasons that I particularly like this sutta is it tells you about the different kinds of presentations that you can hear when the Buddha gives a talk to a different different sets of people. It's okay. So sometimes he gives a presentation that there, he's only talking about a couple kinds of feeling, but he goes all the way up to 108. And it depends on the presentation that you get. So, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pindika's Park. Then the carpenter Panchakanga went to the venerable Udayan. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable Sir, how many kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One? Three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One householder. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither painful nor pleasant feeling. These three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Udayan. Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Pleasant feeling and painful feeling. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. A second time and a third time, the Venerable Udayan stated his position. And a second and third time, the carpenter Panjakanga stated his. But the Venerable Udayan could not convince the carpenter Panjakanga, nor could the carpenter Panjakanga convince the Venerable Udayan. The Venerable Ananda heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between Venerable Udayan and the carpenter Panjakanga. When he fi finished, the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, it is actually a true presentation that the pan, uh, carpenter Panjakanga would not accept from Udayan. And it was actually a, pre a true presentation that Udayan would not accept from the carpenter Panjakanga. Now, one of the things that I started seeing more and more is that people start arguing about it's uh, the sutta says this, and they get real rigid thinking. And that does not lead to a peaceful and calm mind. That does not lead to a happy mind. So it's real important to, for you to understand that there can be a lot of different ideas that are according to the Buddha's teaching but not necessarily to a limited way of thinking. So, the Buddha said, I have stated two kinds of feeling in one presentation. I have stated three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated five kinds of feeling in another presentation. The five kinds of feeling are the five aggregates. I have stated six kinds of feeling in another presentation. This is the sense doors. 
I have stated 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have presented 36 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated 108 kinds of feeling in another presentation. That is how the Dhamma has been shown by me in different presentations. When the Dhamma has thus been shown by me in different presentations, it may be expected of those who will not concede, allow and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will take to quarreling, brawling, disputing, and stabbing each other with verbal daggers. But it may be expected of those who concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will live in concord with mutual appreciation without disrupting or disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Now, I've been with a lot of people that have some very different views, but if you don't uh, spend time saying that this person is wrong because they have this idea, but start looking at what is agreeable, what you can agree on. One of my teachers in, in Malaysia, he was invited to go to a Christian gathering. And when he got there, they asked them, what's the difference between the Buddha's teaching and Christian teaching? And the monk said, I, I prefer not to look at differences. I prefer to look at similarities. And they said, no, no. Now, there was about 150 people at this gathering. As he was talking about the differences between Buddhism and Christianity, people started getting up and leaving. And that did not lead to a good outcome. So look for things to agree upon, not things to fight about. And as the world is going right now, there's an awful lot of people that talk bad things. And it's not worth it. Look for similarities. And if somebody wants to talk about negative opinions about something, you can just back off. You don't need to be around that kind of person. Or you can try to change, change the... Uh, change the things that you're talking about. The whole point of doing metta, the whole point of practicing... Uh, the six R's and loving kindness is you want to have an uplifted, happy mind. You don't want to dwell on negative things. And spend a lot more time appreciating things around you. The more you can do that, the better life becomes for you and you start affecting people around you in positive ways when you do this. So it's a real important aspect of the teaching to keep smiling all the time as much as you can remember. Don't take, take things personally and get angry because of what somebody else thinks or says. It's not that important. Ananda, 
There are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Odors cognizable by the mo nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. Should anyone say that this is the utmost joy and pleasure that beings experience, I would not concede that to them. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now this is kind of an interesting thing because he'll go through all of the jhanas and each progressive jhana is a different kind of joy and happiness that you experience. And remember that jhana does not imply concentration. Jhana is talking about a level of your understanding. When you get into the first jhana, you're not experiencing a worldly feeling. You're experiencing an unworldly feeling. And this is the kind of feeling that arises not only from uh, well, let me put it a different way. This is the kind of feeling that arises because you have a quieter mind. Because you're learning how to focus your mind, you're learning how to understand how mind actually works. And there's a great deal of uh, satisfaction and happiness that arises because of that. Should anyone say that the utmost pleasure and joy that, being, that beings experience, I would not concede that to them. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence, stillness of mind, without thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of collectedness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. When you get from one jhana to the next, 
it's like you're doing a different, you're staying with your, your same object of meditation, but it's a different meditation because now you're going deeper. The joy you experience is much stronger. You don't have uh, any kind of distracting thoughts or very little. The happiness that you experience after the joy fades away, you become very comfortable. And when you get into the second jhana, you start experiencing a lot more confidence. You have a feeling that you are progressing. You're able to stay with your spiritual friend for a little bit longer period of time without any disturbance. And then you'll feel when the, the joy comes up, it will be quite a bit stronger. Now, this kind of joy is called uplifting joy. Your mind is very light, and the feeling in your body is almost like floating. So it's a real interesting thing. And when that joy fades away, you feel more comfortable than you've felt ever. And you keep, as you go to different levels of meditation, you keep feeling the differences. And it's more and more clear all the time. Should anyone say, uh, that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is the other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the fading away of joy, Joy is too coarse a feeling for your mind now. When joy arises and it's, it's fairly strong, there's excitement in your mind. And as you start to go deeper, that excitement just kind of disappears and you start having more and more peaceful and calmness and more comfort in your mind and in your body. You're able to stay with your object of meditation for longer periods of time. <coughs> now this is where, as you get more and more calm and more and more peaceful, the you, you start to lose feeling in different parts of your body. You don't feel your hands or an arm or a leg. Now, if you put your attention on, your, on that part of your body, you will feel it. But if you just stay on your object of meditation, you won't notice that anymore. If there is some contact, let's say an insect walks on you, you will feel that. So what you wanna do is use your six Rs and allow it to be there by itself and come back to your object of meditation. It's very comfortable feeling, very much at ease. As you keep going deeper and deeper, the feeling in your heart is going to change and it's going to move up into your head. This is a good thing. Don't try to push it back down into your heart. Let it come up into your head. Now you're going to get to the um, recognition 
that you're in a mental realm, strictly a mental realm. The feeling in your heart will just move by itself. Some, some people say it moves up to here. Some people say it's up here. Sometimes it's over to the side. It doesn't matter. When it moves up into your head, now you're going to be able to have more and more equanimity and tranquility. For longer periods of time, you're going to be able to sit with staying with your object of meditation without distraction. Now, just for the heck of it, let's talk about a distraction for a little while. What's the cause of distractions? Why do distractions arise? Do you know? Distractions arise because you broke a precept in the past. Now, an awful lot of people, they, they hear about the precepts and it's like a yeah, yeah, yeah. We all, all I, everybody knows about the precepts, don't break the precepts, but they don't follow it very well. You will have a lot of hindrances arising from the guilty feeling of breaking one of the precepts. So keep your precepts as closely as you can and you will notice over a period of time you can get into the deeper kinds of meditation much more quickly and easily when you keep the precepts all the time. When I give a retreat, at the end of the retreat, I start talking about the importance of keeping your precepts and reciting the precepts every day. Not as some kind of rite and ritual, but as a reminder to keep the precepts as pure as you can. This will help your sitting it will help your mind be more peaceful and calm. You'll be able to get into the jhanas much more quickly when you keep your precept without breaking them. So when you get into the third jhana, you abide with equanimity, mindful and fully aware. What does mindfulness mean? That's always a good question because so many people don't know what mindfulness means. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How does it move? What happens first? What happens after that? When you start seeing that, you will start paying more and more attention to how your attention gets sidetracked and how you get caught in emotional upsets and dislikes and that sort of hindrance. So I know there's a big deal about mindfulness that's been going on for a couple of years here in this country. But there's so many different kinds of definitions that it just gets really confusing. If you remember to observe that your mind is not with your object of meditation and use the six R's and stay with your object of meditation or what you're doing at the time and while you're smiling, then your mindfulness improves very quickly 
and your sitting gets better and better. Okay, uh, still feeling pleasure with the body enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. Now, one of the things that people have a wrong idea about, and that is You only can be in jhana while you're sitting. And it's not true. Now, if, if you are successful with your sitting meditation on a retreat, I can give you the opportunity to develop your mastery of going in and out of the jhana at will. You can be walking down the street in uh, the third jhana or the fourth jhana or you can be with other people and still be in the jhanas takes practice but it certainly is worthwhile this is that other kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pleasure nor pain and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is that other kind of pleasure that is loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. When you get to the fourth jhana, you'll notice when you're either you're taking a retreat online or you come and you do a retreat with me. I kind of make a big deal out of getting into the fourth jhana because that's where you have the strongest balance of mind. And you can see things very clearly without emotional upset. Every time you go from one jhana to the next, you go deeper into equanimity and balance of mind. And you wind up being more and more peaceful and calm more happy, at ease. So, should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience? I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the complete surmounting of gross perceptions of form. Now, when you get to this level, you don't feel your body anymore. But if there is contact, you will feel it. If a fly lands on your on your hand. You'll feel that fly, but it doesn't make your mind wobble and shake. You just notice that it's there. This is a, a subtle kind of feeling that you feel now when you get into the mental realms. 
Sometimes people will have hindrances arise that are pretty big and they can still be happening even when you get into these arupa jhanas. But the thing is, whatever hindrance arises, if you're using the six R's properly, you're going to notice that the second step of the six fold or the, the six R's is to not keep your attention on the hindrance. Let it be there by itself. Relax. Next step. Smile. Next step. Return that with a mind that is light, that is smiling. And stay with that as long as you can. But if you have a kind of hindrance that's really intense or really big, if you keep trying to control it, trying to push it away, trying to stop it from being there, it's going to stay and get bigger because you are feeding that feeling with your attention. So you want to back off on that. You want to back off from keeping your attention on something that's disturbing your mind. Let it be there by itself. It's not important that it's there. What's more important is what you do with it. And that is to let it be there by itself. Relax. The relaxed step is the most important part of the six R's. Why? Because when you relax, you're letting go of craving. You're letting go of the false belief in this is me personally. So it's real important for you to understand that the six R's are the fourth noble truth. It is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. That is the path. So it's real important for you to continue on with uh, using the six R's as much as you can. Okay? So, With the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact, aware that space is infinite, a person enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous uh, pleasure. Now, when you get, when you're doing loving kindness, loving kindness will just stay with you until you're the fourth jhana. Then the feeling of loving kindness changes. I'm not going to tell you how it changes. That's up to you to find out. But as soon as it changes, your mind has more and more equanimity in it. Your mind has more balance in it. You're more at ease with everything around you. And this is all the time. Remember to use the six R's during the day. Anytime you find your mind has some tightness in it, it doesn't matter what causes it. As soon as you notice that that tightness is there, relax and smile. Wish somebody happiness. Be grateful for 
the opportunity to have a hindrance arise. Don't fight with it. Don't take these feelings and try to control them and try to push them down and push them away because they're painful. Allow it to be there by itself. Relax, smile, come back and wish somebody well. Even if it's yourself, that's fine. <clears throat> Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, a person enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. When you get to infinite consciousness, this is where you start getting some really, really nice insights into the true nature of everything. The insight that you really start seeing is at one of the sense doors, the eyes or ears, you're going to see very fast flickering. Very fast. Now, that was a roughly a hundred thousand arising and passing away of consciousness. This happens very fast. When you start seeing this flickering at one of the sense doors, you're starting to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away, arise and pass away. Some of the insights that you have when you get to this state is that you are seeing up close and personal, the impersonal nature of everything. This happens by itself. You're seeing that anicca, change, is continually happening. You're seeing birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. This is the difference between reincarnation and rebirth that the Buddha teaches. Reincarnation is you have a, a permanent self or soul that sees all of these things and it's you, it's yours. But the Buddha said there's nothing in the world that is permanent. Everything is in a state of change and it's impersonal. And because there is that kind of continual movement, there's a dissatisfaction that happens with it. So you're seeing anicca, dukkha, anatta, up close and personal. And you're seeing it very clearly. So those are some of the insights that you start to have just as you look around, as you, as you observe life and how things actually work. Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there is another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, 
Uh, what happens is the feeling of compassion changes to a feeling of very happy, subtle joy. It's not the excited kind of joy that you experienced before. This is just more of a happy feeling. This is the kind of joy that you experience with developing the seven awakening factors. This kind of joy is right in the middle of the awakening factors. It's a happy feeling, but it's not an excited happy feeling. So, this is, is what you experience when you start understanding deeply the impermanence the dissatisfaction of everything moving all the time and the impersonal nature. Aware that, okay, uh, and what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness. Aware that there is nothing. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. Now the feeling of joy fades away and you start feeling very, very strong equanimity. There's just no excitement in your mind at all. This is where you start to experience more and more clearly the this enchantment of things. This is where mind is not looking outside of itself anymore. This is where you're just watching mind. Now you'll be able to sit for quite a long time, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, without any movement of mind's attention. You can stay on your object of meditation much more easily. And this is very pleasant. This is very happy that you, you can do that. Okay. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier, more and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now we get into some interesting stuff. Should anyone say that this is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Mm, I just lost my place. By completely surmounting the base of nothingness. Now this is with strong equanimity. And so you start to have more and more disenchantment, food, Although you still have your favorite foods, it doesn't make your mouth water so much. Yes, you know that you have to have food to, to continue on, but it's not so important. So this disenchantment starts to grow at all of the different sense doors. And it's, it's a, a finer degree of equanimity. Okay. Surmounting the base of nothingness, a person enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous. 
when you get to this realm, it's like being asleep and being aware at the same time. Mind becomes very subtle. If you see any movement of mind's attention, any wobbling, any going to a thought, you need to relax, smile a bit, and come back to a quiet mind. Now, an awful lot of people, when they come and they do meditation with me, this is where I start them to sit for longer periods of time. I'm not gonna suggest that for you at home unless you've been practicing quite a lot. I have one student in Malaysia. He is retired and his wife has died so he's by himself he sits for four hours without moving. He sits with a very quiet mind, very balanced mind. And then he gets up in the afternoon and he starts wandering around doing this and that. In the evening, he sits for three hours. So he sits seven hours a day. I know that you're not going to be able to do that. That's a special circumstance. But he can sit for two hours, three hours without any disturbance in his mind at all. No wiggles, no distracting feeling, no distracting thought, just a quiet mind is actually very inspiring. And I'd like for everybody to be able to do that, but I know that that's not gonna happen. When you get to neither perception nor non-perception, you wanna start sitting for longer and longer periods of time. And right after that, you'll get to a place where the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness disappear. When you come back and you see this starting to arise again, very quickly you'll see little tiny teeny bubbles, very fast, arise and pass away. You are starting to see the links of dependent origination. And that's when you experience Nibbana. You'll have a lot of joy arise. So this is a very important teaching about feeling. And this particular sutta it talks about every kind of feeling that you can experience as a human being. It talks about joy and happiness and all its different levels from sense pleasures all the way up to developing your mind's awareness. Okay. Okay. It is possible, Ananda, that wanderers of other sects might speak thus. The recluse Gautama speaks of cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, and he describes that as pleasure. What is this and how is this? Wanderers of other sects who speak thus should be told, friends, the Blessed One describes pleasure not only with reference to feeling, rather, friends, the Tathagata describes as pleasure any kind of pleasure, whatever, 
and in whatever way it's found. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now this is Sutta number 59, if you want to go take a look at that for yourself. So, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Okay, please. Uh, sir, actually I was uh, practicing Vipassana meditation uh -huh. for a period of, uh, from last uh, five to six years. Were you practicing I... Goenka style? Uh, yes, sir. Correct, sir. Okay. Then I got to know from my brother regarding uh, your uh, loving kindness meditation. Uh -huh. Then actually I was experiencing uh, sensations. But as per loving kindness meditation, uh, we have to ignore the sensations. Is it correct, sir? You have to what the meditation? You say ignore? ignore. Sensation, sensations. You don't ignore sensations. You allow the sensation to be there by itself. You don't keep your attention on the sensation. You allow it to be relaxed and come back to your object of meditation, whatever that happens to be. Stay yes, with your object of meditation for as long as you can, okay? Now, if you're doing your daily activities, if you see that you have tightness that happens in your head, in your mind, you can relax that right then. You can use the six hours right then. And you can use smiling as your object of meditation. Light mind. This is why I rather insist that smile as much as you can. The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. The better your mindfulness is, the clearer your mind becomes. And the faster you recognize when mind's attention pulls away. Okay? Yes, sir. Sir, one, one more thing, sir. Okay. Uh, like, uh, while practicing Vipassana meditation, I was in... Uh, in daily while doing sleep, I was observing the sensation and I was sleeping. Uh, should I continue same or should I, can we continue the loving kindness meditation during sleep? During sleep? Mm. Did you say? I uh, mean while sleeping, while starting of sleeping. No, you don't have, you, you're not. This is mindfulness is remembering to observe how you pay attention to your mind's attention moving. When you're sleeping, you sleep. Your sleeping can be quite good. And if you start to have dreams, you can radiate loving kindness into your dream. But when you're sleeping, I know that the Vipassana folks, they really tried to get you interested in the idea of meditating while you're sleeping or reading a book while you're sleeping. No, it doesn't work that way. Mind's attention is, it needs to have rest. Okay? Yes, sir. Sir, one more thing, one last, one okay. last thing, sir. Sir, can you elaborate on a relaxed process, sir? Relaxing process. In uh, six in six R, we have a relaxed step. The relaxing, the relaxing process is letting go of attention and tightness in your head and your mind. It is like uh, breathing out uh, by uh, by breathing out. It is like breathing no, out. You don't do anything with breath. You just relax. Mm -hmm. You don't do anything with breath. You don't do anything. Okay, sir. In my opinion, relaxed step is, uh, I am thinking like that, uh, by uh, forgoing every, everything. Relaxing means forgoing everything. No, no. 
You don't do anything with the breath. You stay with smiling and relaxing on its own. Okay, sir. Okay, if sir. You, if you use a breath, you're going to get in your way and you're not going to have as good or fast a practice. Okay, sir. Okay, let go of the breath completely. Now, if you want to do the breath meditation, I can teach you that. But your progress in the meditation is very much slower. Now, I was just in India, as you all know, and I had about 200 students while I was there at different retreats and that sort of thing. And there were about 110 experiences of Nibbana with the retreats that I was giving. You need, and that has nothing to do with the breath. It has to do with the Brahma Viharas and following the instructions that are given without adding or subtracting anything. Now in 10 days, there were people that experienced Nibbana in 10 day retreat. If you're doing mindfulness of breathing, it's going to take you at least six weeks to get where you do with loving kindness in 10 days. It takes a long time. It is a different kind of meditation. So okay, sir. I like to stay with the loving kindness because it works so well. And I see so many people being successful. It's just great. Okay? Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anyone else have a question? It doesn't necessarily have to be with uh, the meditation itself. It can be a question on anything, any kind of understanding you want to clear up. Hi, Bonte. Hey, uh, I have a, actually a related question about the six R's. Okay, um, speak up a little bit louder if you can. Okay, how is this? That's better. Okay, great. Um, so I have a related question about the six R's, uh, specifically the second step, the release step. Um, so, I mean, sometimes when I'm doing the six R's, uh, I'll recognize and then I'll just go right into the relaxing. So, I mean, is... Just shifting your attention to the relax step, is that enough of a release or is there something more involved in the release step? Well, if you, if you don't keep your attention off of the uh, thing that's distracting your mind, you need to let go of that, then relax and smile. And then come back to your object of meditation. So it's real important to understand, especially when you start getting into deeper parts of the meditation, the importance of not keeping your attention on the distraction. That's better. Yeah, much better. That's okay. So... <clears throat> Don't leave out any of the steps of the six R's. Okay? It's just don't, it just let the distraction, whether it's a painful feeling or a painful thought or a distracting thought of any kind, don't indulge in that. Let it be there by itself and relax and smile and come back to your object of meditation. That's how it works the best and the fastest. Okay? 
You understand? Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand a little bit better the maybe sort of the process. So the reason I'm asking really is sometimes I get, um, I find that maybe sometimes I make a really big deal out of the, the release step of like, oh, don't make a big deal out of it. And I kind of get caught in like this whole kind of conversation and process about release. So I guess I'm trying to find a balance of how much attention to put on the release step before I sort of move on to the, the relaxed step. Well, I'll tell you, the thing is, this is a learning process. And you learn from the pain you cause yourself by doing something in a particular way. And before long, you'll start recognizing, oh, this isn't working. What, what am I doing that's a mistake? How am, I, how am I causing this pain? Because we always cause pain to ourselves. We can't blame anybody else for our pain. So it's real important for you to understand that you are your own teacher. You're teaching yourself. You get caught by something and you get caught up in it for a while and you you try all different ways of getting rid of it and then you go, oh, wait a minute. Let's back off here and just... When I'm teaching a retreat, I try to get people to understand that life is supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be a game. Now, you're going to get caught sometimes and you're going to cause yourself some kind of problem. But then you want to be able to laugh at yourself because you got caught again. And as you do that, you naturally have an uplifted mind. So you can't criticize yourself. No, please don't do that. It's very important that you be kind to yourself. You be gentle with yourself. If you start criticizing yourself, what are you actually doing? You are... Raising unwholesome thoughts and identifying with them and you beat yourself up. I've told this story a few times, but this one man, he was so much into his hindrances. And he came and did a retreat and he was walking around really dog face. I mean, just and sad. And after two or three days, I asked somebody to go out and buy me a pair of boxing gloves. And I had him put the boxing gloves on. He said, why are we doing that? I said, well, you want to beat yourself up so much. I thought you could do it without hurting yourself so much. Don't do that to yourself. Don't criticize yourself. Don't get hard on yourself. Be gentle with yourself. That's wholesome. Judging, condemning, all of these kind of things, that's unwholesome. So you want to spend more time with being nice and helping yourself and being grateful for the opportunity that you have to use the six arts. The lighter you become, the better your mindfulness becomes, the more happy your life becomes. So it's a real important thing to continue on with the meditation as much as you can remember during the day. Be kind to yourself, okay? Laugh. I know I'm one of the few meditation teachers that I, I tell you I want you to laugh. I want you to smile. I want you to have fun. 
When I say that in India, you should see the surprised look on people's faces when I say that. It's good fun. But this helps your mindfulness to get better. Every, all of the different kind of suggestions that I make are the suggestions that will help you to be more happy all the time. So please do that. Have a happy mind. Laugh with yourself because your mind's crazy. And it's okay to have a crazy mind because all of us do. We all get caught by our little likes and dislikes. But as you do this meditation more, what's going to happen is you're going to see that you're not caught for as long. So you still are going to have your ups and downs, but they're not going to be as radical as they were before. So it's a real important thing to remember this. Okay? Thank you. Keep smiling. Keep happy. Don't get serious. All right? Does anybody else have a question? Andy, I have one question. This is Ken. Okay. Okay. Andy, I've been meditating um, uh, 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 quite good. It's I sit. I can sit about two to three hours without any problem. But well, not without problems. About two hours in, I have this very strong um, hindrances. Like you know, mine is all over the place. Uh, sometimes I just I just have to give up. And, no, uh, no, 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 no. You, the way you overcome restlessness is not by quitting. It's by stop fighting in it. Stop trying to push it away. Don't keep your attention on the hindrance. It doesn't matter if it's physical or mental but you make a big deal out of it in your mind. Oh, there's this problem, and now I'm going to fight with it and try to control it. And you just cause yourself more, more suffering. So what you want to do is just let it be there. Stop paying attention to it. Ah, my mind's just going crazy. It's crazy anyway, so I'm not going to pay attention to it. It will settle down by itself. Another thing that the Buddha said was bring up a feeling of tranquility and relax into that tranquility and stay with that and the restlessness will start to fade away by itself. I noticed that <coughs> boss is always almost like a the same thing, you know, like it's, it's so I, you know, one of your your tapes said there's a, a, a attachment. I, of course, if there's an attachment in my mind to this uh, particular event, then, you know, it's always going back to it. I don't know how to release this attachment. Well, the, the attachment you have to it is that it's there and you don't want it there. Yeah. So <laughs> why don't you laugh at it? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> And just bring up a feeling of tranquility. Stop making it a big deal in your mind. Yes. Okay, your mind's going to do that. Fine, it can do that. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you do with that. You allow it to be there. You relax into it. And kind of make fun of your mind for being crazy. Okay. Just laugh with yourself a little bit. One of the things that happens in, in Asia is an awful lot of people, they have fear. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they have fear of ghosts and goblins and all kinds of, oh, this person put a hex on me. 
and so they have a lot of fear. Do you know how to overcome fear? Laugh. Laugh, and the fear disappears very quickly. It's just an attachment. This isn't what I want to feel. This isn't what I want, the way I want things to be. So you laugh with it, and it changes. And no more problems. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Hello, Bhante. So stop, stop being so serious. Yes. Uh, Bhante, I was uh, practicing loving kindness uh, and I had done one online uh, course as well. And the good part is uh, when I was walking outside, I am sending loving kindness and I am feeling very, very good about that. Good. And I have a question regarding my practice. Uh, like uh, I can sit for like uh, one and a half hour or one hour 45 minutes. Okay. Uh, and sometimes I find that after uh, one hour 15 minutes, something like that, there is some, there is a trying mind in, there is something I want to try. How to let go of the trying mind? Well, stop making a big deal out of it. Stop pushing yourself to make your mind be the way you want to be because that's how you cause your own suffering. Back off, smile, lighten your mind, relax, and come back gently to your object of meditation, your spiritual friend or whatever. but you can't be pushy with your mind. You can't force your mind to do what you want it to do. Because it's going to do what it's going to do. And the more you try to push, the more painful it becomes. Yeah. And you need to back off. That's one of the things that I, on retreat that happens quite often is I'm continually telling people, you got to back off. Stop trying so hard. Stop trying to control it. Because who's trying to control it? I'm trying to control it. Who doesn't like it the way it is? I don't like it that way. So I'm going to keep pushing and trying to make it better. And the more you push, the bigger and more intense the feeling becomes and the more painful it becomes. So it's a real important thing for you to realize that you are causing your own pain when something doesn't meet your expectation. So back off with your expectation. Oh, my, my mind's real active right now. So, eh, never mind. Okay. Relax into it. It's not so important. Okay. It's the expectations that we get caught with a lot. And that causes all kinds of suffering. So, the more clear you become, the lighter you become and stop getting serious with stuff, the easier the meditation becomes. And it's supposed to be fun. Turn it into a game. Don't get over serious, please. Okay. Okay. I have another uh, question. Uh, okay. It is related to Sutta. Uh, in one of the sutta, it was said that uh, what you feel, that you perceive. What you perceive, that you cognize. Is it uh, saying that, uh, is it saying that uh, uh, whenever a hindrance comes, if you keep the attention on it, it will be bigger and bigger? Or it will get my understanding is correct? Why? Because you make a big deal out of it. Because you want to control it. Okay. 
You have to let go of the controls. Okay, got it. Relax, lighten your mind up. Laugh with yourself, have fun. Anytime you see your mind getting serious, guess who has an attachment? Guess who's causing themselves pain? So you want to back off, relax into things. Have fun with your life. Just because the first noble truth says there's suffering in life, well, yeah, everybody knows that. But that doesn't mean you have to suffer. That, that's what the third noble truth is all about, letting go of the suffering. Thank you, Bhante. Thank and you. Is, for... And that is the six R's. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for answering my questions, Bhante. Okay. Anybody Bhante? else? Yeah. Bhante, yes. Um, I've got a question, but it's not strictly connected with the meditation because Doesn't I don't... Matter. Uh, can you can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. And the the question is, um, what I'm trying to do is, I'm really trying to be more present in my life. Uh, when I get out of the uh, meditation, I'm trying to be very very pl uh, present in 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 my life, trying to get the same feeling, get the loving kindness around, and spread it uh, where where I can. And uh, sometimes life is like very distracting yeah some sometime someone will someone will call me someone will uh, do something tell something or i just stumble upon something and then i i'm lost i completely forgot that i should be present is there any trick like some practical thing i could do to Absolutely. go back to this there is something that works and it's so easy that we forget smile right smile have <laughs> fun. Let go of the judging mind. The I like it, I don't like it mind. Let go of being serious with it. Turn everything that you do into a game. Okay? Make it fun. Be happy. Well, sometimes I don't feel like being happy. Okay, laugh. Laugh at how crazy your mind can become. Now, this is not a kind of teaching that you're going to hear very much in Buddhism. But that's what the whole point of the Buddhism is. To learn to let go of unwholesome and develop wholesome. Smile. Stop being serious with life. There's nothing to be serious about. Don't try so hard to be perfect. You're not going to be. Okay? We're all going to have mistakes. But it's okay to have a mistake because that way you can see it and learn how to overcome that problem. Have fun with it. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, hi, Bhante. It's, uh, I have two questions. Um, okay. One question is that you mentioned um, you bring up tranquility when you can, and um, I wonder if there is any middle step to do that, like in um, Meta, you say we have to think about or send Meta to a spiritual friend, Right. Um, or is there any a step to, or middle a step to get to that feeling of equanimity Smile. that you come in? Smile. Okay. Sure. The more you smile, the easier it becomes. Okay. The other 
question is that um, I guess follow up with the previous question. In day to day life, there are so many inst um, instances that you come across the point that um, when you are doing vacuum meditation or you try to send meta around, um, you keep forgetting that. I guess is also we come back to a smile and start doing that. You sending the meta. Six hours. Okay. Forgive yourself for not being perfect. Forgive yourself for making a mistake. Be grateful that you are aware that there is some pushing that you're doing in your in your life and you're trying to be too perfect. Don't be too perfect. Relax into it. Don't okay. be too judgmental to yourself or others. Allow other people to make mistakes. Allow yourself to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're not going to learn. Right. So try not to be perfect with what you're doing. Try just to have fun with what you're doing and you'll see that eventually it does turn out better. Okay. okay. So coming back to hindrances, I guess one question is about procrastination and not seating. Do you have any recommendation for that? And um, <laughs> yeah, use the six R's. Smile, okay. laugh. See every kind of hindrance that you experience is because of a past mistake that you made with somebody else or with yourself. And you feel kind of guilty because of it. That's why the hindrance comes up. So when you use the six R's with that, eventually everything starts fading away. It will start to go away after a period of time. Okay. Oh, my my, my right. teacher, the Venerable Lucille Ananda, I was with him for two years. I, I stayed in the monastery. Anything he wanted done, I did and helped him in any way that I could. And he reminded me every day that I have to develop my patience. Things don't happen as fast as we want them to. So we want to be patient. Patience leads to Nibbana. I heard that so much it used to drive me crazy. But it's really true. Be patient with yourself. You're not going to be, practice makes perfect, eventually. Okay. So, don't try too hard. Don't put in too much energy. Oh, and in India, I had a lot of students that were going, uh, they practiced with him for years, some of them for 20 years. And I found out that almost everybody tried too hard. When their mind had a hindrance come up, all of a sudden they put a little bit more energy in to get rid of the hindrance. And that's exactly the opposite of what needs to be done. You need to back off. Don't try so hard. Lighten your mind. Don't resist or push. Soften your mind and smile. Okay? Okay. Write that down on a piece of paper. Drops. Don't resist or push. Soften okay. and smile. And you'll see some wonderful things happen because of that. Okay?
Right, fantastic. Thanks. One last question. You mentioned about um, training that you can go in and out of jhanas at will. Um, right. How can one person um, start don't training? Teach on that? that until you become successful with the meditation. Okay. Not an easy practice. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. Of what country are you in? Oh, I'm in the U.S. You are. Come and visit me. Okay, sure. I, I was there last year, but I'm looking forward to be there again after this pandemic. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Hello, Bante. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Andrew. I'd like to ask about the cessation and Nibbana experience. I've had a few times this kind of experience, but uh, last time, two days after this experience, I experienced quite strong anxiety, like, uh, you know, hitting something. Well, that says you didn't have the experience because it takes the anxiety away. Okay. But it was a blank spot, a relief, um, pervading joy. But two days after, I felt strong anxiety. You want to be able to lighten your mind more. Don't question. Don't get uh -huh. involved in an internal dialogue about what you want to see happen. Relax. You're being too serious. Mm -hmm. You got to lighten up. Okay. And anxiety disappears when you do this. I promise. It will happen. Okay. It's just that you're putting in too much effort to to make it the way you want it to be. Back off and allow it to be the way it is and it will change on itself, on its own. Okay? Okay. And please smile more. You have such a beautiful <laughs> smile. Continue. Okay? Okay, 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 okay. Look at how much better your mind feels right now. There's no anxiety, right? No, no. I was, yeah, I was, I was just, you know, wondering what this happened again because it's you just know that you're pushing a little bit too hard. You know, I think so. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> See your mind feel better now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Hi, Monte. Oh. Hey, how are you? How is it are me? you? Been? Or is it <laughs> sorry? Hi. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so I was wondering um, about precepts. And sometimes I can get very curious about the precepts that the monks take. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if it's helpful to sometimes add more to the five precepts and say, okay, that makes sense for me to do. Or is it better to do the five precepts very well? It's best to do them as closely as you possibly can. Okay. And not add any more, because sometimes I can read the Vinaya and be like, that's all very interesting. And yeah. um, I'm finding that I'm naturally kind of adding more to the precepts, but it, sometimes I feel maybe that's a little bit more distracting than it needs to be. Well, the five precepts is all you need to really follow. Okay, unless you're doing a retreat, then it's eight precepts. But do five precepts. 
And I would suggest that you don't read the Vinaya anymore. Five precepts is enough. Because the Vinaya is for monks. And monks have to be around their teacher for five years before they really start to understand how this stuff works. So you picking up the Vinaya and just saying, well, there's this rule and I need to follow it. No, it's not quite like that. It's a little bit different, so be careful with that, okay? Keep that beautiful smile you have going, okay? Be happy. <laughs> okay? Anybody else? Okay, then I'm going to share some merit and then give this over to David to do whatever he wants to do with it. So, may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and all beings find grief. May all beings share this merit that we have acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. Beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu. Okay. Now I'm going to, I will be back next week, same time, same station. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.